Fendris is a harsh world where tribes constantly make war to wrest ever-changing territories from the monster-infested waters of the cruel seas. Every tribe must fight for its survival, for its existence depends upon the prowess of its warriors. The youth of Fenris is inevitably blooded early, for in the society where war is the only constant, even children must bear arms. They are battle-eager. These young warriors hope to earn a place among the space wolves, who their legends describe as warriors to the gods themselves. Way back in January 2020, I made a video about the Warhammer set that kind of started it all for me. The second edition Warhammer 40,000 starter set from 1993. I mean, that's currently my second most popular video on the channel, so if you're watching this you probably already know what I'm talking about. So in that video I said it was my aim to paint up the entire box set in vibrant 90s colour schemes, splitting the Space Marines into four different chapters, and painting all of the Orcs and Gretchen as Goths. Well, we painted some Gretchen! And then I kind of got distracted by this retro zote, and then I fell back in love with 90s Necromunda again, and then I got distracted by literally hundreds of other things in 2020, but the time has finally come. I'm going to paint up the first combat squad of 90s Monopose plastic space marines. Kind of. When I told people I was going to paint a squad of Ultramarines, a squad of Blood Angels, and some Dark Angels, and some Space Wolves, some very kind Space Wolves players pointed out that if I built the squad I suggested in the video, it wouldn't be game legal. In 2nd edition, Space Wolves didn't have tactical squads like other chapters, and I'd either need to choose only bolt guns to make a pack of Grey Hunters, or only heavy weapons to make a squad of Longfangs. Now to me, Longfangs are the quintessential Space Wolves unit, so I decided to go down that road. Now, I didn't want to waste all the heavy weapon marines from the box set, so I decided to track down some vintage Longfang models. I found some on eBay, and the seller sent me some bonus goodies too that I unpacked in a recent livestream. Thanks again, Paul. So here are the models we'll be painting for this video. We've got this chap standing valiantly on a rock. Two of these guys with the very fancy wolf pelts. This marine who can't find a helmet big enough to fit his head. I know the pain. And finally, we've got the Longfang Sergeant. In terms of weapon options, we've got two missile launchers, a LAS cannon, and a heavy bolter. We've got four regular power packs, and one power pack with a banner pole for the sergeant. I still think it's pretty cool that 30 years on, the proportions of these power packs hasn't really changed much at all. A little bit bigger, sure, but they're basically still the same. What a great design. I did get some old plastic components like arms and shoulder pads with this eBay lot, but there weren't enough intact right arms in the right angle pose you need to hold the heavy weapons. Now to make enough, I used a couple of Naughties tactical squad arms, trimmed off their weapons, and filed the top sides flat. Not too bad. The arms are almost identical, but the hands are slightly smaller compared to the 90s models. And once it's all painted up, I'm sure no one will notice. It'll just be our little secret. I only had two of the empty-handed left arms from the 90s box of goodies, so I did the same trick again with a couple of the modern Space Marine arms. After cleaning them up a bit, I crudely sculpted a bit of space between their thumb and fingers with my knife too, like they're slightly open-palmed. The metal models also needed a bit of a tidy up, so using the back of my hobby knife, I scraped away any obvious mould lines, and then clipped off a few of the tiny tags hanging off pointy bits. These models have already been stripped, but there was still some residue of paint left in the recesses. Metal models are super easy to clean up. You just put them in a glass container, pour in some acetone, wait five minutes, give them a little swirl, and then scrub them with a toothbrush. Good as new. Before we get painting, I also just spent a few minutes with my pin vise and a drill, boring out gun barrels in the soft metal, and pinning the heavy weapon arms using small lengths of paperclip, super glued in place. For ease of painting, I'll be keeping the weapons and power packs separated from the bodies, so just at the moment gluing only the left arms to the models and sticking them to their bases. I drill holes in lollipop sticks and attach the heavy weapons using tiny dots of super glue, which should be easy to snap off later. I also drilled little holes in the power packs and mounted them onto little plastic cups for easy painting. I gave all the models their mandatory 90s basing of PVA glue, sand, and then another layer of PVA glue on top to seal the deal. Once that was dry, we are ready to prime. To keep all the colours nice and vibrant, I'm going to be priming white, just like they recommended back in the day. 
However, I'll be using Halford's white plastic primer as it's got a really smooth finish and it's pretty tough once it's cured. Now let's get some retro inspiration for this paint job. What better place to look than the 1994 Space Wolves Codex with the eye-popping cover art by Jeff Taylor. The colour pages in the middle have some outstanding shots of painted Space Wolves and we can instantly see there's a couple of slightly different painting styles on display here. The first, like on Ragnar Blackmane, is quite pale with very smooth layered gradient style highlights. The second, like the ones on the Wolfguard, are slightly deeper, richer blue with tighter edge highlights rather than very smooth gradients. I mean they're still very soft looking but just a little bit more contemporary in style. One of the ways they recommended painting Space Wolves in an old painting guide was by using dry brushing, but to be honest the armour in the Codex showcase photo certainly isn't dry brushed. So if I'm going to try and get something similar to these Codex shots, it's going to take quite a lot of effort. Now just a quick disclaimer, I've painted a lot of models, over a thousand for sure, but I've never painted any Space Wolves, modern or retro. When I collected Warhammer in the 90s, I always loved the aesthetic of Space Wolves, but I just didn't think I was a good enough painter back then to even try it. Blood Angels were my Space Marine army, and they were much easier to paint. So this isn't a tutorial so much as a step-by-step -step video diary of my first attempt at retro Space Wolves. Right then, better get to it, eh? While I'd love to be able to paint all of these retro models up with vintage Citadel paints, they're getting pretty scarce these days, so for the most part I'll be using Coat d'Arms paints, which are a great colour match to the vintage Citadel range. For the armour I'll be base coating with Shadow Grey, and then building up those smooth highlights by mixing in Lupin Grey. To save a bit of time just for the base coat, I'm going to spray on the Shadow Grey using my airbrush. I've never actually tried Coat d'Arms through an airbrush before, but it's got a pretty thin consistency, so I reckon it'll work pretty well straight out of the pot. And yeah, just as I thought, after two thin coats of Shadow Grey, we've got a really nice, slightly desaturated pastel blue, a good match for the models in the promo shots. Before we start highlighting the armour, it would be a good idea to start blocking in all of the other base colours first. Here comes major challenge number one, painting a solid, smooth, bright yellow. Yellow is notoriously tricky, even with modern paints, but I think it'll be a nightmare with these vintage paints. To help me along, I'm going to be using Vallejo Pale Sand to undercoat the areas that will be yellow eventually. It has a nice opacity, but it isn't grainy at all, so it should give a nice solid base to lay that yellow down on top of. After two very thin coats, I started adding a bit of yellow to the diluted pale sand, coat down sun yellow, and started layering up. Thin coat by thin coat, slightly more yellow each time, until I had a decent yellow layer. For the final coat and to really max out the saturation, I added a couple of drops of cadmium yellow acrylic ink to the paint mix. Smooth, opaque yellow over a darker colour. It can be done. I also blocked in all the areas of fur, hair and skin using pale sand. Again, it'll make a great foundation for the colours we'll add in a minute. It's always important to keep the paint very thin at early stages like this, as we don't want to clog up all of that lovely hand sculpted fur detail and the grizzled faces. To paint the bronzy gold areas, I'll start with Dwarven Bronze and eventually build it up using bright gold. Dwarven Bronze is pretty opaque for this range, which makes it really nice for base coating. As well as their funky trinkets, I'll also paint the pipes on the Power Packs Bronze too. I used a barbarian leather to paint their pistol and ammo pouches, as well as the backs of any of the wolf pelts. In the Codex, some of the weapons have black casing, but it doesn't look like a true black to me, it's kind of like a very rich midnight bluey black on the page, so I mixed Vallejo's black and Signal Blue in roughly equal parts. I used this deep blue black to paint the weapon casings, and also any of the areas that would be base coated gunmetal silver later on. And as you can see, this is 100% not a speed painting exercise, I was being very careful in taking my time here. You can imagine a careless brush move when painting black right next to that yellow that took me so long to smooth out would make me want to chuck the whole project in the bin. For most of the base coating I'm using my size 2 Winsor & Newton Series 7 by the way. Moving on to the silver parts, I started out using gunmetal, but to be honest I thought it was a bit too dark and dingy for these vibrant retro models, so I then switched out to chainmail instead, which is a bit lighter and shinier. Now as you watch me add the silver bits, let me tell you a little story. 
A couple of months ago, Kyle, one of our supporters on Patreon, sent me a message saying that he ran a new merch company called Snazdragon and asked if I'd be interested in checking out some samples with maybe a view to collaborating in the future. Now we already have a Teespring store with one Midwinter Minis product, the Stop Staring at My Wiggly Boys t-shirt, but to be honest, while it was perfectly average print quality, they seemed pretty expensive for what you got. So basically, Kyle and I ran some tests, I love the quality of the stuff he made, and now I'm happy to announce that the first ever official Midwinter Minis logo t-shirt is now available to buy through the Snaz Dragon store. Also, they're only £16.99 instead of £19 like on Teespring, and you're getting a better quality of print. If you fancy grabbing one, check the link in the description. If you're a supporter of the channel on Patreon, check out a recent post on our Patreon page to find a juicy discount code. Thank you for your support. Now, after I was happy with the silvery bits, I referenced the codex to see what other main colours there were, and each right pauldron and one of their knees has a black and white geometric design on it. <sighs> this is going to be… fun? It's probably easier to build up the white now and then paint the black on later, so I thinned coat dams white very heavily and glazed on three very thin coats to the knees and pauldrons. While I was doing that, I also decided to add a little shark tooth design to the end of one of the missile launchers too, and to make the rockets a little bit more interesting on the other missile launcher, I also did a diagonal split design so the missiles are half white and half black. I reinforced this white, little by little, one thin glaze after another until I had a relatively smooth, solid coat. Modern painting wisdom tells you to paint white using a very light grey, and then only highlight with pure white. But let me tell you, I've seen some of these retro models they photograph with catalogues and codices at Warhammer World, and the white sections are pure, beaming white. Moving on to the skin, I used Dwarven Flesh, thinned nicely, to add a bit of colour to their faces, all the while taking care to avoid their beards and bushly eyebrows as best I could. For the red sections, I decided to give Vampire Red a try. It looks pretty similar to Mephiston Red, and actually had pretty decent opacity. Using this, I painted the handle of the Power Axe, and then started glazing the axe head so that the colour was slightly more vibrant at the edge of the blade and faded to that dark blue-black in the centre. Whether I'm thinning for base coating or heavily diluting for glazing like this, the majority of the time I'm using a little bottle of DIY thinning medium. It's half water, half acrylic matte medium, and then a tiny drop of dish soap. It works just like Lamium medium, but it's a fraction of the price. This whole bottle of medium that I used to make it only cost £9, and when mixed with water it'll make enough thinning medium to fill 20 large citadel pots. Now if that was all Lamium medium bought from a store, that would cost you about 100 quid. Suddenly, £9 for a big bottle like this seems like a pretty good deal, huh? Anyway, while I had this red out, I added some retrotastic flame designs to the barrel of the LAS cannon and one of the missile launches, giving them two thin coats to make sure the coverage was even. Before moving on to the next colour, I base coated the eye lenses, rangefinders, and a few random orbs on the heavy weapons. To lay down a traditional green coat on the bases, I chose to use Vallejo Intermediate Green. Its opacity is outstanding, and it's actually pretty close to the original Goblin Green colour. I'll touch on that more later in the video, but once the bases were a nice solid green, it's time to start adding some depth and shading. Taking a look at other paint jobs in the Codex, while the focus on the armour is definitely these smooth edge highlights, the recesses are also very subtly darker too. To do this on my own models, I mixed the original base colour of Shadow Grey with a bit of Deadly Nightshade, a deep rich blue paint, and added plenty of thinning medium. At this point I also switched out to a much smaller brush, probably one of the smallest brushes I've ever used on the channel. This one is the small size from Squidmar's fancy brush set. Good job Emil. You got it buddy, I got your back. I used this teeny tiny brush to carefully line the panels of the armour, and this will help bring out some definition in a subtle way without going overboard with something like black wash. There's a lot of armour panels, and this step on its own took several hours. I wasn't too worried about staining flat areas of the armour, as I'll be tidying them up later, but I was very, very careful not to hit any of the other colours, especially the yellow and white parts. Once I was happy that all the main recesses on the blue armour had been shaded, I pulled out my shadow grey again and quickly fixed any obvious mistakes. After that, it was time to build up the highlights. 
While the character models in the codex obviously have these luscious gradient highlights, the rank and file have much more basic, tighter highlights. So to achieve this, I'll simplify the process a bit and apply one generous edge highlight with a mix of shadow gray and lupin gray, and then add a tighter edge highlight with just lupin gray. And that way, it'll give the illusion of a subtle color transition, but hopefully without spending days and days just on this step. So here's what the first thicker edge highlight looks like on the left, compared to a model without any highlights on the right. Switching to just lupin grey, thinned nicely so it flows easily from the small brush, I started to add very tight, slow, controlled edge highlights. Either using the very tip of the brush for flat panels, or the edge of my brush if I was highlighting along a raised edge. Again, after I was happy with the lightness of the highlight, I then switched back to shadow grey to cut into the areas where I felt the highlights were a little bit too thick and messy. I remember back in the 90s when I painted my Blood Angels that it's way easier to paint a mid-tone stripe down the center of the raised strip on the helmets than to try to carefully highlight each side. Okay, next up, let's do some shading on the other parts like the metal and the fur. While Coat d'Arm's washes are very effective, the black armor wash particularly has a glossy finish once it's dried, so to shade the armor, I'm just going to be using Old Faithful. Citadel shade paints are pretty great, but the temptation to have a big bottle of very liquid paint wide open on your desk can end up being pretty messy. One of our Patreon supporters sent me these cool silicon pot holders that he actually makes, and I gave them a try out here. They basically work with suction. You press the pot down into the cup, and it won't let go without a tug. And then, if you've got a flat surface on your desk, you can press the holder down, because it has a concave bottom, and it sucks on. It's not going anywhere. Pretty nifty. Good job, Gareth. If you are living in constant fear of spilling your shade paints and becoming a sad meme, I've put a link to Gareth's website in the description if you fancy picking up some of these squidgy lifesavers too. Wah, wah, wah. So using Nuln Oil, I carefully shaded all of the silver and metal parts, and also sunk a bit into the areas that were very deep and shadowy, like between the dangly bits under the boss man's belt. To shade the flesh, I used Ink Flesh Wash. Pretty straightforward, eh? Not a lot of skin here though, but I was very careful to not accidentally get it anywhere else. For the yellow parts, I broke out the chestnut wash, a really gorgeous warm tone that stains in a very soft, pleasant way. Thinned it with a little bit of medium, and gave the Aquila on the top of the banner pole, as well as the Aquilas on the Marine's chest armor, a quick coat. I also used chestnut wash to make the brassy gold areas a little bit richer and add some subtle shading. Now focusing on the pelts, I grabbed a few ink washes, yellow, brown, and black, thinned them with some medium, and painted them on in different patterns on the fur. I focused the darker colors towards the top, and used the brown for the main body of the pelts, and then used yellow just to add a bit more warmth and saturation towards the tips. Going around all five of the models in a cycle, when the last one was painted, the first one was dry, so I could reinforce some of the colors, especially using the black at the top of the pelts and between the different sections to give them a bit of separation and definition. Once those ink washes were totally dry, I grabbed a small flat brush to do some very gentle dry brushing. This will help bring out all that lovely hand-carved texture and help blend the different color transitions together a little bit. Happy with the fur, I moved on to brightening up the gold parts using a paint called Bright Gold. I mean, let me tell you, as someone who's partially colorblind, I love simple naming conventions like this. Using the small squid mar brush again, I just carefully tapped a few key highlights. I then went back to Dwarven Flesh to reinforce the mid-tone on the skin, leaving behind stained areas just in the recesses. And then I added a tiny bit of pale sand to that skin tone mix to create a few very soft highlights on the pointiest bits of the faces. Looking at the codex, they didn't really go overboard with skin highlights, it's all quite subtle. To give the salt and pepper effect on the sergeant's beard, I used a black wash close to where the hair was growing out, leaving it white towards the long parts and the tips. Each one of these space wolves is very patiently waiting for the Tooth Fairy to visit, so to make sure the fangs shine brightly, I gave them a very thin coat of white mixed with pale sand. I also used that same colour to add some very gentle highlights to the facial hair. And now using just cadmium yellow ink, thinned with some medium loaded on a small brush, I very carefully added a few highlights to the feathers on the Aquilas, and also tidied up some of the edges on the yellow pauldrons where I messed up the blue highlights. Now, as much as I love the colours of Coat d'Arm's reds, I need decent opacity because I'm painting over quite a dark red base coat here, so I opted to use Vallejo's Scarlet Blood, and added this lighter tone of red towards the edges of the designs on the weapons, 
the left sides of the weird orb things to eventually build up to a cool shiny effect, the eye lenses, and also glaze some towards the cutting edge of the power axe. Now to add a final touch to all those red glassy objects, I added a few very carefully placed white dots of paint in the top right. Now this looks way better than it has any right to considering how few steps it took. Okay, this is where I have a serious chance to mess everything up. The codex shows that the Space Wolves have some pack markings on their right pauldrons, and most of the examples are jaggedy, black and white designs, so for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to say my squad of long fangs use the pack markings of a repeated pattern of squares split into triangles, one white, one black, repeated forever. It sounds easy, until you have to start painting it on a bright white shoulder pad that took you ages to get smooth. I started with hardly any black ink on my brush, and just very carefully traced out the vertical lines to get the spacing, and then started filling in the diagonals. The thing I keep telling myself is that it doesn't have to be perfect, I'm just getting the rough shape down. Once I was vaguely happy, I filled in the bottom right triangles of each square with the black ink. And after doing that on each model, I switched out to thinned white paint to fix the lines that went a bit too far into the areas that should have been white. And this step was just hours of tedious back and forth on five different pauldrons. Some are better than others, but in the end, they're all okay and will look cool on the tabletop. Turns out precise geometric shapes are actually quite tricky to paint freehand. And I was kind of done with painting geometric patterns after this, so I thought it would be cool to give each model a unique rune on their white knee pad. So I took some inspiration from some of the designs on the modern Space Wolves transfer sheet and painted each one with black ink. Before I put the inks away, I used one last bit of chestnut wash to add a bit of shading to the recesses running down the rims of the pauldrons, trying to be as straight and smooth and controlled as I could be. Okay, transfer time. Now fortunately, I don't have any of the proper vintage transfer sheets, but the Space Wolves designs have remained practically identical over the last three decades, so using a modern sheet, I just grabbed five of these wolf head symbols to use on the yellow pauldrons. I cut them out with my hobby knife, separated them into individual designs, and then submerged them in a little pool of water in a jar lid. I find it's always handy to keep a couple of empty jars in your hobby space, you never know what you'll end up using them for. While I waited for the transfers to release from the paper, I moistened the pauldrons with a tiny bit of my thinning medium, which will hopefully help it stick a bit smoother and flatter, and then lifted out each transfer one by one and placed them on the pads. I used my paintbrush to wick away the excess moisture, dried my brush on a paper towel, until there was just enough liquid to carefully push and prod the transfer into the right position. Once I was happy with the position on the first one, I then used that model as a reference for all of the rest making sure that they were all roughly the same position on the pauldrons, equidistant from the edges. I left them an hour or so to dry so I wouldn't accidentally nudge them into a different position, and then I added two thin coats of my thinned medium over the top to hide the shine that the water slide transfers often have. I also added the long fang skull logo to the side of a couple of the weapons. Okay, almost ready to glue everything together and get the payoff, but before that though, there were a couple of areas that were lacking highlights really. Firstly, the leathery pouches. I mixed barbarian leather with pale sand and did a quick dirty edge highlight, but I also added some scratchy effects to give a bit of a comic style leathery texture. I then went back to the chainmail silver paint to add a bit more shine to the metal parts, always being careful not to go into any of the recesses that were stained with nulm oil. Also, the black housing on the heavy weapons and the bolt pistol are totally flat at the moment. I really want them to read as black and not grey, so I'm not bothered about going overboard, but they'll need some subtle highlighting. The coat d'armes fantasy range doesn't really have any neutral greys, so all of the greys are either very blue or quite green, so I mixed up my own highlight by adding a lupin grey to Vallejo's black, both of which have already been used on the model so far, so it should be quite in keeping with the general colour scheme. Just a quick bit of edge highlighting here, nothing too fancy, nothing too exact. Also, it's quite easy to worry that you've added too much edge highlighting, because wet paint looks much brighter than when it's dry. It dried pretty dull, and that's kind of what I wanted. Now feeling a bit fancy, I used the small brush to also add some grey highlights towards the top of the Space Wolves logos on the pauldrons, and this way it might suggest that they're slightly 3D, but also it meant I could gently push down the small areas where the transfers had creased. Lazy hobby hacks, woohoo! Okay then, let's get the bases done. Now, I could have used Coat d'Arm's Goblin Green, but as those of you who saw my 90 Citadel paint set unboxing know, I have a brand new old stock Goblin Green in my collection now. While we've got both here, let's do a direct comparison. 
Looking at the pots, the colours are incredibly similar, but how do they compare when painted? Both have been in the Vortex Mixer for 10 seconds, and the Coat d'Arms version doesn't go on very smoothly. It's quite streaky, and will need a few coats to get a decent colour coverage. Now how about the original Citadel version? Smooth as silk. And solid coverage in just one coat. And even after two coats, and three coats, the Coat d'Arms version still can't compare to the original in terms of smoothness, and it also dries slightly darker. However, check out how close Citadel's Goblin Green is to Vallejo's Intermediate Green that I painted the bases with. Just one coat. Not bad, eh? Anyway, let's use the Citadel version to paint the textured bases and the rims. To add some simple yellow dry brushing to the bases to match the 90s style, I chose to use Vallejo's Flat Yellow, which I tried out when I was looking for a replacement for the modern Citadel Flash Gits Yellow, which is drying up on me. It has pretty decent body and opacity, so I think it'll make a good replacement. I used a small dry brush to scratch the grassy effect onto the green textured bases. Okay, time to assemble. I washed my hands first to make sure I didn't leave any finger grease behind on the models, and with a sharp twist, all of the parts that had been glued to lollipop sticks or the paper clips snapped off easily. The paint on the underside of the arms is a little bit thin because the airbrush couldn't quite get to the areas behind their mounts, but to be fair, you won't really be able to see that when the arms are attached either. I used super glue to attach all the parts, occasionally snipping off or trimming contact points that stop pieces sitting tightly together. Also, the way these heavy weapons attach is notoriously tricky, and quite often you have to remove huge sections of the right side vent on the power packs to make them sit properly against the body. It feels a bit naughty after all that careful highlighting, but it has to be done. I gave the rims a final coat of goblin green to hide any yellow marks from the dry brushing, and the squad is ready for battle. Well, almost. There's one more thing I need to take care of. That sergeant is going to need a banner. I do have a couple of banners, but they're not for Longfangs, and I haven't spent two weeks painting these Space Wolves to use the wrong banner. Oh no, I'm going to make my own. To give me something more solid to work with than just flimsy paper, I cut a section of aluminium out of a drinks can using a hobby knife, and then once it was out, I used scissors to trim it down to the right size, and making sure it was roughly straight. Once I was happy with the size, I cut two strips at either side, and then removed the section in the middle. These little strips can be carefully bent to hook over the banner pole. And once I tested it on the actual model, I squidged the flag onto a cocktail stick to hold it more firmly while I painted it. I primed it white, and then I gave it a way too thick coat of vampire red. Maybe I hadn't thinned the paint enough in the cup because it was sputtering like a mad thing. Airbrushing is not easy mode, I'll tell you that for free. Anyway, once that was dry, I started glazing lighter shades of red, all the same colours I've used in this project so far, down towards the bottom of the flag, starting from about three quarters of the way up, and then adding more and more yellow to the red to give it a more orangey, fiery look by the time it was highlighting the bottom. I then added a tiny bit of that signal blue to the original vampire red and glazed towards the top of the flag, reinforcing that cool colour transition. I'm not going over the top here, just something fairly subtle. I also painted the whole back of the flag using this colour too. By this point, I'd had my fill of painting precise black and white geometric shapes, and I'd already sunk so much time into this project, I thought I'd do some big brain cheating by using the sawtooth checker strips from an orc transfer sheet to create borders for the bottom and top of the banner. Perfect. I then used the final large white longfang skull design on the Space Wolves transfer sheet to add a logo in the middle. And once that was dry and a few layers of medium were added to take off the shine, I was pretty happy with my simple retro banner. Time to attach. A couple of tiny dots of super glue on the banner pole where it'll touch, and I shoved it on. Now, let's get these models off the little plastic cups. Holding them carefully by their bodies only, I don't want to break anything now. And that, as they say, is it. Five fabulously 90s second edition style Space Wolves. Being honest here, I can't stop smiling looking at these models. Now, I don't have to tell you, you're already watching this, but nostalgia has this weirdly powerful effect, and I am properly beaming with these models in front of me. If you think they look cool too, please hit the like button on this video. And while I give you some fancy turntable shots of each model and the squad, I'd like to give a shout out to the channel's latest Patreon supporters. Three Rats in a Trench Coat, Joseph Hunt, Katie King, Jason, Ian Dodds, McLovin, Pio Ikes, Dreamer Out There, Still Loading Jake, Andreas Korsten, Nicholas Bush, Queeky, Victor Kornax, 
Justin Hook, Stan Kramers, Phil Brown, Tobis Trum, Nicholas Greenhog, Hopper, Pastel Miniatures, Jason Nikorchuk, Mark Morgan, Bartosz Debski, Tom Boot, Sparta Jackal, The Old Scal, Old Chopsy, Luke, Star Pupil, Hector Ginray07, Cool Yen, William Hobbs Etheridge, Andrew Radford, Kevin Rapley, Daniel Holman, Bearded Assassin, Aaron Smithies, Gareth Gnella, Davy Jones, John Divley, Jakub Turan, Jo Hansenson, Joshua Pavelzik, Ramones Razor, Brickface, Brian Spears, Paul Kenyon, Marianne Ruchon, Dan and Gordon, Ash Farrar, Mr. Luke Dancer, Phil Cummings, Charlie Wake, Stig, Azulas Cherniaskas, Benjamin David Wanacott, Andy Luck, Spectro Poetics, Tom Weston, Connor T. Norton McWilliams, Togi Toast, Jedge87, Kasparis Terkilsen, and Benjio2546. So, all in all, from cleaning, trimming, building, and painting, this whole project took me about 70 hours. And then obviously I had to put this video together, which is obviously no small task. It's the length of an episode of a sitcom and it takes just as much editing. And that is why it took two full weeks between videos for this episode. Sorry about that. Back to the models for a second. One thing I love about these Space Wolves is just how heavy they are. Even though they're a lot smaller than their modern Primaris counterparts, each model weighs up to 35 grams. A whole squad weighs almost 160 grams, that's five and a half freedom ounces. A modern plastic Primaris Marine fully painted only weighs six grams. So a single metal long fang weighs as much as a squad of five Primaris Marines. It feels great to move them until you inevitably drop one and all of its arms fall off. Oh well, that's metal models for you. So after sitting in my to-do pile for more than a year, that's the first episode of Retro Painting Space Marines done, but I still have all those plastic models from the second edition box ready to go, and Space Wolves has been ticked off the list. That means I've got space to paint another chapter on top of Blood Angels, Ultramarines and Dark Angels. Now what would you like to see me paint? Maybe some Imperial Fists? Rainbow Warriors? White Scars? Black Templars? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check out the official Midwinter Minis t-shirts if you want to be on the receiving end of knowing nods from nerdy strangers, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.